panel on uh, migration, uh, skill athletes is a good continuation for those of you uh, who presented earlier. It's a different way of looking at, uh, not a different, a complementary way of addressing or studying African sports. Uh, we are only four, I think the program we had uh, a fifth presenter, he won't make it. Then we are only four. Uh, it's a round table design more to have good conversation and discussion than major presentation on our papers. Uh, I will start Gerard Kindes, uh, then Todd, Chuka, and Marta will, will finish. Uh, we have a few A few points of discussion we kind of gather before coming that we are going to address in the discussion. Everybody brought a few things we think important to discuss. Uh, we we'll go back to that once we finish our short presentations. Uh, my my presentation this is too sensitive. Uh, it came out of this issue of African athletes leaving their teams when they travel. They travel not everywhere, they travel mostly in the Western world, in Europe, Australia, in the US. We had last summer, we had, uh, 2012, we had the Olympics, major issue with uh, Cameroonian athletes, not just them. And more recently, I think it's in October, a Francophone game in Nice, in France. News, African athletes are disappearing from their delegation. Some disappear even before the beginning of the competition. Some will disappear in the middle. The, no matter how we want to look at it, it is an issue. Uh, and I go through the news. Uh, it depends on how they want to portray green, greener pastures. That was uh, in the Olympics. Athletes looking for a better place to live. Uh, embarrassment that things you will read, people are not, uh, they think it's an embarrassment that you bring a delegation abroad and athletes disappear. Uh, and one article said that most of the athletes are coming from poverty, crippled, country crippled by poverty and corrupted countries. That's a general map of what they, they use to describe this issue. Uh, True, may not true, but that's something we see in the news. The reaction varies a lot. Uh, some Africans, journalists, uh, officials, we, we talk about nationalism. These athletes are not nationalists. How come, how do they dare go abroad to represent their country and disappear without playing? What is wrong with them? They don't respect the flag they are carrying. Uh, some will say sport administrators, sports organizations in Africa don't respect this athlete enough and they run into uh, police problems and that's why some of them will leave. One special case, and this is just Eritrea, that is linked to politics of Eritrea and most of their athletes, they disappear in Africa, even not in Europe. A whole and uh, Eritrean team disappeared in Uganda, I think, Completely, but that's what political. But most of the other cases are not political. Generally, there are many other reasons. Uh, some will look at it as loss of talent for Africa. These athletes were trained, investment, and then they go abroad, they will disappear. Uh, but the most constant feeling of African official and Af other African athletes is embarrassment and shame. Now, uh, the reaction, more recent reaction, it is Senegal and DRC, uh, Congo. They decided to ban traveling for some of their disciplines. Athletes shouldn't go abroad anymore for one or two years. That's countries, uh, action countries are taking to prevent this problem. But the reality, when we look at all this, from a more critical view, after emotional reaction, 
we are dealing with basic migration patterns, which are uh, defined by the pull factor that Western countries all them, um, themselves put in place. Very appealing media when you watch games on TV, you watch facilities, you watch uh, success, it is there. This is very appealing to um, all these athletes. Uh, the living standards. We talked about, Michel talked about the athletes running the world, running around the globe, making money. The money they bring back, all these things represent very great incentive for local athletes with no much to go abroad. And they go abroad because they want to, to first, as athletes, you want to play at the highest level. You want to ex uh, express yourself in the best condition. And your country is not providing it. That's pushing you away. You look at your future, and this is a trend across the continent. Athletes are more and more, more, and more unschooled. There's no much opportunity for employment to set their career as athletes. Opportunity to go abroad to get your chance. You go. You at home. Your parents tell you, you get a selection, you get a visa to cross these walls of uh, Schengen visas. This is a unique opportunity, it is your chance. And with all the belief, you have a new chance, you have to go. And the last thing is politics. The one I don't believe, it's the most uh, critical one today, is politics. But it's also there. Uh, beyond all this situation of athletes defecting, I think from an, a, an intellectual and academic point of view, there's a lot of questions that are critical to the migration from Africa. First, it is Africa is unblocked. It's unblocked by a long, numerous laws and rules to prevent Africa to go outside, to reach the Western world. And that's you, we cannot deny it. It is a, a, something that is in place. It is a pushing factor that uh, athletes are going to use any means to go abroad. And it is a constant, it's not going to change. The walls are there, there are visas, there are regulations, uh, the treatments they give to the descendant, even for to get the visa. Some athletes don't get their visa to travel, some artists don't get their visa to travel. It is a reality. When the opportunity comes one, you take it. The other aspect, the globalization of sport, the commodification of sport has a strong appeal. Unfortunately, it is on so asymmetrical that the only thing Africans can do, because they don't have the means, they don't have the industry, they don't have the support from their country, it is to try to get the other side where resources are available. And media plays a big role in supporting and sustaining all these aspects. And when we hear about the disfaction, my analysis it is more how do we address more critical aspects related to uh, economics, unemployment opportunities, and the management of sports. That's what I think about when I think sports and defection in African countries. That's really the only point uh, I want to make for you to uh, discuss, and I leave the space and the floor to Ted. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I come to this round table as a relative newcomer to uh, soccer, football research, research, or sports research in general. So I'm sort of a long time fan, but first time researcher, if you will, to use the talk radio. Uh, I'm currently engaged on a project that examines um, the migration or immigration of African players from Portugal's colonies to the metropole from roughly the mid 1940s until 1975, the end of the, the colonial period. Uh, most famous among these players is Eusebio, probably many of you know that. Uh, but also, uh, Eusebio is a top 10 sort of all time uh, FIFA player, but Mario Coluna as well is sort of a top 100, if you care at all, about FIFA all time rankings of players. And I'm not sure anyone does, but nonetheless. But of course, there are hundreds more that, that sort of nobody knows about or that sort of flew a bit under the radar, if you will. Uh, these athletes are so famous in, in great part because they vaulted uh, what was a pretty horrible Portuguese national team uh, to sort of unprecedented levels, um, and as well as their club teams, including a third place finish at the 1966 World Cup 
and of course a number of Euro uh, European Cup championships, mainly by the firm. Yeah, almost exclusively by Benfica um, in the 1960s and into the early 1970s. So just have a couple of images here. This is a sort of iconic image of Eusebio leaving the field um, after the loss in the semifinals in 1966 to England, uh, kind of lamenting the 2-1 to scoreline. Um, he also played particularly poorly in that game, but I suspect he's not lamenting his own performance here. Um, and then this is the image of the 1966 uh, starting 11. And so what's interesting here, at least from the pers perspective of my work, is that there are four African players in the starting 11. Uh, Heladio is the third from the left standing. Uh, Vicente Lucas is the second from the left. Um, Eusebio is on the bottom, the third from the left. And Kaluna, who I mentioned a moment ago, is the second from the left. Um, they all happen to be from Mozambique, so but I don't want to read too much into that. There were plenty of Angolan players, Hibernian players, uh, so on and so forth. Um, in terms of scholarly treatment, outside of a handful of sort of biographies, which really are hagiographies, named basically of Eusebio, uh, there's been very little sort of, uh, or virtually no scholarly treatment uh, of these players. Um, so in addition to sort of thinking about their own pitch exploits, um, as I've been conducting my oral uh, archival research, including interviews with these players and coaches, teammates, etc., uh, finding it sort of a number of interesting uh, aspects about this history of emigration and migration. And I'd like to highlight just three of these today. Um, hope that we can discuss these later. So in particular is the importance of providence uh, and the unexpectedly less pronounced importance of race um, in this history. So let me just explain something for one sec. Uh, for the Portuguese dictatorship, the inclusion of these African players was primarily political. So it afforded the regime an opportunity to highlight the alleged unity of the metropole and the colonies in an attempt to maintain its colonial empire. And this is at a time when Portugal is coming under increasing pressure to, to decolonize the post-war period. So what I found in my research is that race was of very little importance in these players' experiences, and thus it's not as experientially important uh, as one might expect, especially given the ways that scholars, including myself, have generally characterized uh, Portuguese colonialism as more or less institutionalized and codified racial exploitation. Um, so while still in the colonies, these African players were on racially integrated squads, uh, befriending black, white, and mestizos with a lot of uh, teammates alike. Moreover, these relationships were deepened uh, when white, black, and a lot of players traveled together to the metropole uh, to play. And there were also new relationships forged with Portuguese teammates upon their arrival. So every single player that I've interviewed um, has sort of dismissed my inquiries about racism uh, and racism that they experienced, subtle or overt, among teammates, families, and so on and so forth when they arrived in Portugal. Um, instead, I mean, these players are heroes. They end up dating, often marrying Portuguese women, often multiple Portuguese women, uh, serial uh, husbands, um, serving as spokesmen for you name it. I mean, they became sort of the face of, of uh, a number of Portuguese companies at the time in advertisements and so on and so forth. Again, oftentimes it's Asia, but not exclusively. So if race is backgrounded in this, um, this history, what does emerge as an analytically important uh, component is providence. And by this I mean the sort of common colonial origins of both black and white and mestizo players, such that black players were uh, as close to white African and mestizo players as they were to other black players, other black migrant players. Um, so keep in mind, most of these white players who are traveling to Portugal had never set foot in Portugal prior to arriving. Right? Portugal was as foreign to them as it was to these, these African players. Due to the nature of Portuguese colonialism, uh, they were born in the colonies, their parents were often born in the colonies, and so on and so forth. And so they also had to apply to travel to, the, I mean, they had to receive permission from the Portuguese government in order to travel to the in order to travel to the, the metropole, sorry, just the same way that the, the black African players do. And so this, these, these sort of, um, this, so I'm currently exploring this notion of providence as it relates to interracial relations, which is an area uh, of examination that's generated very little uh, attention among Lucifer, scholars of Lucifer in Africa. And just quickly, um, so here's an image in the 1960s of Eusebio, um, Costa Pereira, and Coluna, and this is not coincidental, all, all three of these players are from Mozambique. So they were all on Benfica at the same time, and they all hailed from Mozambique. And you have, this is sort of, exemplifies this racial spectrum. Eusebio is considered black African, Costa Pereira is white African, and Coluna is actually his, 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 his Portuguese father, African mother. Um, Okay, so second, what, I'm, what I've been interested in is, is, the, um, is the importation of not only players' soccer skills, obviously, 
but also labor strategies that they had either learned or observed and then internalized prior to the departure uh, to Europe. So in addition to building upon work uh, by scholars who have examined Africans' application of skills, labor techniques, etc., in the diaspora, I'm hoping that the study adds examples of labor strategies that were creatively and innovatively applied. So sort of building upon work, with, um, for example, Judith Marnie and Frederick Knight, where we're talking about very specific skills that travel through these individuals. Um, I'm kind of making a case for the, the sort of importation of labor strategies as well. So thinking beyond the particular skill sets. So despite the otherwise extraordinary nature of these individuals' lives, their experiences suggest strong uh, continuities with and affinities to popular labor strategies, including seeking occupational advice from more senior employees, or in this case, teammates, engaging in secondary migration in order to improve their working conditions, and so on. So for example, prior to leaving Africa, many soccer prospects sought occupational advice from black, white, and mestizo players, again, this transcended race who had already migrated to Portugal. So typically inquiring about wages, what wages they should see, which clubs offer the best working conditions, living conditions, so on and so forth. Uh, and then once established in the Metropole, they're also seeking advice from more experienced players when it comes time to renegotiate their contracts. And sort of the uh, perhaps most interesting case, Eusebio often talked about how he relied on Coluna um, for advice on how to engage with Salazar, the Portuguese dictator. And in so many ways, Coluna told him basically to shut up and let him do the talking. Um, so he, he was, I had a great interview with Xavier, and he was laughing about this sort of experience. Um, uh, these players also engaged in well-worn labor migration strategies, retracing the footsteps of migrant laborers, in this case, soccer players, who had preceded them in order to secure the best possible wages and conditions, reminiscent of, for example, Mozambique in seeking uh, employment on the South African mines. Uh, as I mentioned, many players also engaged in secondary migration, subsequently affiliating with a series of different clubs within Portugal just as mine workers might deliberately switch employers in an effort to improve their working condition. So thus, even as these players are navigating this, this sort of very drastically different terrain, they're falling back on familiar tactics and strategies that transcended their soccer skills. Or at least this is what I'm arguing. Um, in practice, the migration paths that players traverse did not, however, always simply culminate with their arrival at a new club. Many parlay their ability to relocate to Portugal to continue their academic studies uh, or to secure long-term employment in the country. Uh, both of which were intended to sort of safeguard their, these athletes beyond the end of their playing days. And of course, they had these really short careers. And in fact, they were not allowed to leave the country. That's something we can talk about if it's of interest to folks. So, uh, in fact, Eusebio, as you might imagine, had a number of suitors from across Europe. And Salazar, the dictator, declared him a national treasure. And therefore, he was not allowed to play anywhere else besides Portugal. Um, when the other players sort of flirted with foreign clubs, they found themselves under the police surveillance and so on and so forth. So it was clear that you were you were welcome to come to Portugal, but you were not welcome to engage in any sort of secondary migration beyond Portugal borders. Keep in mind this is in a dictatorial context. Uh, third, and sort of the last point I want to sort of bring up today is um, I'm interested in this sort of multifaceted process of cultural assimilation that helps players adjust <coughs> to their new surroundings, in this case Portugal. So I'm arguing that this process commenced often inconspicuously in Africans' urban colonized spaces, and thus well before these players ever set foot in Portugal. So in practice, because virtually all of the African clubs with which these players were affiliated prior to being discovered uh, featured Portuguese coaches um, and were racially integrated squads, uh, and they're also invariably all located in urban areas, low value European colonization. Every one of these future migrants, regardless of their particular social backgrounds, spent time in these spaces and thus were exposed to Portuguese customs and values, etc., prior to leaving the continent. And so this process of assimilation is beginning in the colonies, and it's, it's extremely important. So just wanted to show you a few images of some of the squads um, from the 40s. Mario Wilson is the third one in from the left. He's one of the first players to go from uh, Mozambique. He's, he goes in 45. Uh, he's Mishti, so he's Mulata. Uh, here's Eusebio's club from Lorenzo Marsh, which is now Mabutu. He's the third one over on the left uh, uh, squatting. Uh, Fred of Yahoo, this is a team associated with the railroad. But again, you can see the racial integration, the racial mixed squads that they're, that they're fielding. Uh, and then this is once we're in Portugal. So Porto, one of the Portuguese, uh, one of the big clubs in Portugal on 55, 56. Um, Benfica starting 11 from 73. I don't think I need to tell you this is from the 70s. Um, but nonetheless, when goaltenders goal were caps. Um, anyway, so this, uh, so it, 
In turn, Africans, African players' familiarity with Portuguese culture helped them transition upon reaching the metropole and ultimately to assimilate reasonably effortlessly. Um, but this exposure to Portuguese coaches and teammates isn't sort of the entire story. So the Portuguese regime is always trumpeting these rags to riches stories. And Eusebio is, in fact, a rags to riches story. But these are the narratives um, in which these forlorn Africans rose to the very highest levels in Portuguese society via their soccer acumen. But players like Eusebio are really the exception rather than the rule. So instead, most of these players were members of an extremely small, sort of privileged minority in Portugal's colonies who had benefited, benefited from otherwise rare educational opportunities and were oftentimes uh, mixed race, so the offspring of Portuguese fathers and African mothers. And therefore, in the Portuguese context, they enjoyed this status called the assimilated, or assimilated status. Uh, as Heladia, one of the players I pointed out before, uh, who was from Mozambique and was also in Shtisu, explained to me during our interview, quote, there were many players who lived quite well in Lorenzo Marques and only came to Portugal because they wanted to play for a club that mattered and for their recognition. Uh, the metropolitan clubs that facilitated these players' migration to Portugal also played a role in this typically smooth transition by reducing opportunities for conflict, confrontation, and culturally based uh, confusion. And so what they typically did was once these players arrived um, in Lisbon, um, they would whisk them away to team houses, in which case they'd undergo some sort of like, acculturation. Um, but again, this process had already started in the colonies. Um, and so they'd often kind of keep these guys under wraps for a while until they sort of learned the navigated this new system. So in some ways, anyways, the point is that many African players' migration to Portugal more accurately constituted a form of geographical rather than social mobility as they were moving essentially from one advantaged environment to another. So these are some of the themes I'm hoping to discuss, which were already indicated before, perhaps we can discuss it at greater length in this context of labor or athletic migration. So thank you very much. discussion today is actually about uh, migration of Nigerian footballers. Uh, essentially, there have been a lot of um, scholarly work on migration, uh, some of them touching uh, African footballers. Particularly, uh, I cite uh, Bale's work where he looked at geography of migration uh, of footballers, uh, particularly from Africa. Nigeria provides a lot of players from Nigeria. Nigeria is probably the leading country in terms of transport football in to overseas uh, overseas countries. Now, the, in the past, we've tracked the phases of this migration because there have been different phases of migration of Nigerian footballers. Uh, we could count up to three phases, all of them with different reasons why that migration took place. But what I'm really looking at today, or the things that I'm looking forward to talk about is, what are the causes of, those, um, of the decision to migrate? And essentially, I find um, four themes from analysis of media, particularly newspaper, newspapers in Nigeria over the years, to be able to track, to see four themes that exist. Now, these themes are not entirely independent of each other. So as you listen to it, you will find that there are uh, overlap in terms of some of them. Uh, a major one that has been cited here already is the economic one. And with the economic one here, it touches both male and female footballers in Nigeria. Uh, in prison, no matter the work on female football, uh, there's a large number of female footballers who are living in Nigeria, and most of them are playing professionally in these Scandinavian countries. Uh, it's for similar reasons that they leave Nigeria, that is for economic reasons, uh, because it's really not profitable and you cannot survive playing what is both professional football in Nigeria. Uh, that has been problematic. Uh, for males, of course, that's a major issue. Uh, but this really changed. Initially, if you look at people who are footballers in Nigeria, you could become a celebrity and all of that. Or you retire the next day, you go into poverty. Uh, that was the situation in Nigeria. So no parent really wanted their child to play football. Uh, but this changed. And the marking period for this change was 1982, when one of these footballers, uh, Christian Wokocha, he left and came to the United States to go to school. 
But after his school in the United States, he went over to Portugal and played for Sporting Lisbon. And came home uh, with his Mercedes. And the other players were looking at it, a football player that's driving a Mercedes. This was on head of. Uh, and so he helped a lot of the early footballers at that time, including uh, Silvano Sopala, who's part of the national team uh, technical crew today. He helped them to move into Portugal. This was the first place. I remember now that in terms of colonial relationship, there wasn't a between Nigeria and Portugal. So this sort of was an anomaly when you look at the other analysis of migration of uh, footballers from Africa and so on. But of course that has changed. Uh, in, today, in, in today's world, very few Nigerian footballers are actually in Portugal playing today. But that was the early part of it. Uh, and I mentioned this just to point out where this thinking about footballers, uh, where it really uh, made a change. But beyond that, the other things that also happened was that in Nigeria itself, the footballers usually are paid in a variety of ways. One of it is you are paid your monthly wages. You are paid a bonus if you win a game. If you don't win a game, you don't get that bonus. Then you are paid a sign-on fee for you to sign to play for that season. However, during the season, most of these promised or most of these contracts are never fulfilled. You don't get the money for it. If you are lucky, you get part of the sign-on fee because that's what enables you to sign. So you probably will get maybe 20% and there's a, uh, a promise that you're going to pay later. But they stay years and years, you're not paid, you report to uh, the National Association and nothing is done. So this is one, one of the things that lead, lead the footballers to leave because they have families to feed. And they are now forced to borrow money in order to survive on a daily basis. Even though by their contract, this shouldn't be an issue. So that's one of the things that's leading them to move. But beyond the economic reason, you also have the issue about class, uh, class struggle that exists within football. That is here we look at football labor on one hand, and on the other hand, you look at the management. Uh, in Nigeria, you have uh, the, the existence of uh, what is called the power distance dimension. Uh, most of you, if you have read its hosted work, where he looked at culture all over the world, he came up initially with four dimensions. One of those dimensions was power distance. And Nigeria really ranks high in terms of power distance. What it really means is that in countries that rank high in power distance, that essentially the, the differential in terms of power relations is accepted. It is not something that people will be opposed. So you know that somebody who's in this position is supposed to be all powerful and you have to respect the person, you have to bow to them, you don't question their action. So this exists within the football leagues in Nigeria, where these managers basically take dictatorial actions, they make decisions without consulting anyone, and footballers just live with it. They don't make any complaints about it, uh, but there are a few cases where that have been explosive. And one of those cases I mentioned is um, the footballer that plays for Heartland Football Club in Nigeria. Heartland used to be Nigerian champion uh, for several years uh, under the name of Iwanya National, but they are now Heartland FC. He had been owed money for several years and wasn't paid. So when he moved to another team, uh, Enyuba Football Club, he waited for the fixture, the league fixture when Heartland would come to town to come to Enyuba. The day Heartland came to town, he hired some young men and they went and kidnapped the uh, officials of, uh, of Heartland along with the boss. And uh, he had to be paid before he would release uh, the boss. This became a major national issue. But again, it was stemming from the, the economic issue. Here you see how economic issue is linked to the issue about class and somebody resisting that class oppression. Uh, but the other point that I also want to discuss today that I mentioned is the issue about performance, which I, I, I label as performance politics, is that the Nigerian footballers until quite recently knew that they really could not make a big name playing in Nigeria to 
make a big name, they looked at it as one, either you're playing in a foreign country, or second, that you are able to play for the Nigerian national team. But at this time, the Nigerian national team did not invite any local player to play for it. You had to be playing overseas. That was a mark of you know, good performance before you could make the national team. So basically, for them to make that national team, they sought to move outside Nigeria and then be able to make the national team. That's one of the issues. The other one is the social effect, and I think here Gerald mentioned that he yeah, talked about the effect of transnational media. Uh, this is a major issue, particularly from Supersport, which is a television station. Uh, most of you, if you have a relationship with Africa, you know it's a very powerful television station that transmits all over Africa. And essentially, they carry a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, foreign football league games like the EPL and the Nigeria, that's the major league that people watch. And that is associated with, you know, the, a league that is superior, and they look at the Nigerian league now, which is the local league, as the other. That is the league that you really don't want to be. So that comparison exists. Uh, so people look at the, the um, their goal is to be able to play in that superior league that everybody gets to watch. So that's one of the one of the things that's occurring. And the other one on that, that I also made with social is the issue that football today has changed from the description that I gave earlier where I said that parents did not want their kids to play football because you would certainly regard, you will become poor after playing football. But over the years, since the 1980s, this has changed. Our parents now want their kids to play football at the highest level because this is one way of social mobility that is entering the well, the wealthy class. Right? Because if you are able to play in the big leagues in places like uh, England or some Western European country, then basically you lift up the family. The family becomes in another class rather than the poor class that that footballer may have come from. So essentially these are the key issues that I have as the talking points for my discussion today. Research in the late 90s around women's basketball in in Senegal, and um, one of the things that struck me in an earlier panel, they mentioned um, Senegalese wrestling, which is now the most popular sport in Senegal, actually. Um, but um, men's football had been very very popular in Senegal. Wrestling had been very popular, but at least in the late 90s, when I was there, when I had been there, women's basketball was the um, third most popular sport, and so this is one of the things, and looking at, I was there exploring women's sports in general, um, and Suzanne Baller, who's here, has also written about, I think, both basketball and soccer in there, women's soccer. Um, but basketball uh, was not just popular for women, but it was popular in general. So you had, um, at least when I was there, it was more popular than the men's game, and, and it was the featured sport. So they would have men's games and then women's games, and a few people would come to the men's games. But then when the women's game started, you'd have these entourages coming in and the big men would come in and there would be all these people and there was a lot of business that would take place around women's basketball. And it was um, partly because women's basketball was successful um, nationally, uh, internationally, at least on the continent. So I wanted to go to this slide here. So, and this is actually out of date by one um, medal here. So uh, the women's basketball team, this is in the FIBA championships, which, um, they lead the pack in terms of, of success. Um, Senegal, the men's team is pretty high too, with, with you know, at this point, 14 win, wins, uh, 14 medals. Um, the Senegal team, the, the women's team, in Maputo in September, they also got a bronze medal there. They didn't win the gold, but they won the bronze, and so now they're up to 19. So they're very, very successful, and part of you know the story, in, you know, in the case of people coming back with a Mercedes or something like that, the women, they had gone to Nairobi, um, and actually I think it was a different competition, but they, the, the national women's team had won in their, um, had won in Nairobi and then came home and were given apartments by the Senghor and Senghor's wife. So it became a turning point where, well actually even before then there was a turning point, but really 
with all the um, unemployment and the, the inability to find housing in general for the populations, especially in the urban areas, basketball, women's basketball, became a way um, that families saw that their girls could do something to make it. So girls it, it became much more encouraged to, to go into basketball. Um, you had a lot of local teams. Um, there were, um, this is just the all African medals, all African games where they, they're also very successful. But there's a very vibrant, at the end of the 1990s, there's a very vibrant um, league in, in Dakar with a couple of other teams in San Luis, um, in Chez, um, a couple other places, but mostly around Dakar. Very, very active um, leagues with women um, often trying to find the best deal between the different leagues. It was all amateur, and I think it still is technically all amateur, but they would get effectively some kind of employment through it, um, where it was unofficial, but for the main team, uh, one of the main teams at Duke, which is at the university, the, the, the teams, the clubs there would find employment for them, maybe on the campus, maybe they, it was just cleaning the dorms, or maybe um, they were working in some Ex, you know, some two bobs house or something like that, and they 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 would find a p employment for them, and they would also pay them stipends for transportation or for food or other things. And so there was a set of negotiations that would go along in terms of this informal remuneration for playing basketball. And so there were opportunities, but um, for for men's basketball, you know, there there was there was you know some opportunities, but it was really the women's the women's basketball ruled the day. So this was in the late 90s. Um, I, uh, my research mainly took place then, and so I had been asked to write a paper to look at um, women's sport in a Muslim country, and I said, okay, I'll write about this. And I tried to catch up as much as possible with what was going on just via the internet. Um, and so I haven't been back since 1998. I've been back since, but not specifically to do research on um, basketball there. But what? What seems to have happened to me, and this is more of a hypothesis that I would love to go do the research, but maybe some young scholar um, will come up and do this, and I have to say there's a lot of young scholars now. There's actually a woman who's doing research now on women's soccer in Senegal, and it's some really great stuff that she's coming up with. Um, so somebody may want to go look at this, but my hypothesis is that in the interim between 1990s, the late 1990s, and now, um, there has been a great shift in um, the, the options for basketball players in general, and particularly for men. And what's that, what has happened is that the NBA has discovered Senegal. And the NBA is going there and recruiting many more players, and it becomes much more of an option. And that may be through the colleges. Um, so they're getting access to the colleges. And you know, we know, especially in the men's sports, in the big men's sports in the United States, um, your TOEFL scores and your SATs may not matter that much when you're trying to get into the university. Um, at UC Berkeley, we recently had a big panel about how you know, big sports were really um, problematic, and there's a lot of issues around how that connects to the academic images that many people at UC Berkeley have. This is now an option for the men's basketball, and I think in the years in the intervening years, the men's game has become much more exciting um, for the Senegalese community as a whole. So in the media, um, the games, you know, the, the teams there, they're playing not just for the local community, they're playing for, national, for international attention. They're playing to you know, get recruited. And it may not just be for the United States, it may also be for Europe, but the NBA has really, through their efforts um, across the continent, in recruiting, I think has changed the game. Now, um, Michael Ralph has written a lot about men's basketball in, in Senegal, and um, a couple of things that, that he noted that um, the, let's see, of a hundred and, uh, um, this was in, in late, actually this was from the Africa, ba Africa Basket website, um, in 2011, of 181 Senegalese players abroad, that were tracked by that website, only 21% of them were women. Um, so 38 of those were women. Most of those are men playing overseas now. Um, Michael Ralph reports that Senegal has produced more NCAA basketball players, male basketball players that is, than any country besides the US and Canada, but the nation's female players have yet to attract a comparable level of interest from international scouts. Um, I know that UC Berkeley, not the current coach, but the prior coach, 
um, she was very interested in, in Senegal. They actually had a Senegalese player on the team who came from a diplomatic family and was recruited from Japan when they were in Japan. And so she had went to an international school, had no problem with vocal scores. And the UC Berkeley coach took the whole team to Senegal and they played a couple games in Senegal. And I have to say, I don't know that she was recruiting as much, maybe she hoped, but um, there was thoughts that she was trying to adopt the baby, so that's a whole other issue. Um, she's no longer the coach at, at Berkeley, but I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Um, but, um, Michael Ralph was suggesting that um, the imbalance is not simply due to the lack of opportunities for women um, in the U.S. and Europe, but it has to do with the, the, how the push-pull factors operate differently for men and women. So he argues that for male basketball, it's a migration well within the Senegalese framework um, outside of basketball as well, that, um, that for the men it is it is important to be to go out to emigrate to find income and send that home in terms of remittances and there's a whole lot of literature around the um, young men and the Maurids going out and doing this well women do that too it's he argues that it's more important for the women to you know to stay at home and figuratively and live and literally reproduce the nation at home so that's maybe part of a hypothesis I'm you know I think that it'd be interesting to to look at these options for men and women but one thing that I have noticed, so um, back in the day for the women's national team, all the women played on local teams in those local leagues. In recent times, um, so that you have the NBA's players recruiting, the statistics here, Michael Ralph's work, um, so that few played at home, but now in the 21st century, I've noticed that everyone on the national team plays overseas. And it seems like that, similar to what you're saying about the Nigerian men's team, that to play on the women's team, the national team now, which is still successful, um, relatively speaking, um, you have to play overseas. And I just noted, um, and it was hard to find this, and it's, you know, it's Wikipedia, so who knows if this is exactly the fact, but in the Maputo, the website for the Maputo games, which just took place in September, the website's already gone, but luckily, some, somebody put it up on Wikipedia, the squads, and looking at the players on the um, women's team, and this is the women's senior team, that went to Maputo, um, there are two players whose club is in, in Senegal, in uh, San Luis, Senegal. So none of the players are even in a Dakar club. They are either playing um, in the NCAA in the United States, there's one player who's been written up in American papers, um, Lu Mao Chiang, who, who plays for the Crimson Storm in the United States. Uh, several of the players are playing in France at various clubs in France, um, one in Spain, and interestingly enough, there's one playing in, in Abidjan, um, a Senegalese player in Abidjan, another one playing in Mozambique. So they're not playing at home for the club teams. They're playing abroad and then they're getting chosen for these teams, I, uh, for the, um, the national team after having played bronze. So that's a big change. Um, I don't know that there's still that many opportunities for them. One of the things that's also, and there's two things I'm gonna mention here, one of the things that's happened, whereas they, it used to be women's basketball could do no wrong, it was all over the papers, they were the celebrities, and maybe they still are, but there's just been one crisis after another, it seems like, in women's basketball. So there was this huge disgrace in, in the Czech Republic, they were refusing to play games, they were saying they hadn't been paid, and you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, he said, she said, who did what, did the coach do this, did the coach do that? Um, when they lost to Angola in, in October 2011, this was a big national disgrace, especially because they lost to Mali. This was bad, <laughs> they lost to Mali. A lot of allegations in the tabloids. They didn't even try to go to the Olympics and in Sydney Olympics in, in 2000. It was a big deal that the Senegalese team went and you know, they were not only the darlings, darling in Senegal, they were the darling of you know, the international media, you know, the, the, the narrative about these African teams going to be big. Um, but now, you know, the coach was fired in 2011, and so there's been a lot of problems. Um, at the Maputo games, they came in third. So they, they did medal, but they came in third, and so there were some losses there. The one last thing that I, I wanted to mention is that there's, um, so there was the, also the Francophonie games took place in Nice, um, and this was a younger team that went um, to the Jeu de Francophonie, and Guess what happened there? Um, a, I can get to the right one. Um, yes, a, um, one of the young players, um, 
uh, and Jeff Lowe left, and she's um, she didn't come back. Um, they can't find her. She defected, um, and the whole you know everybody is is put on this crisis mode. And as Jean-Claude was saying, the the basketball federation said, okay, if she doesn't come back, the men's team can't go to Spain. And so they're they're trying to, they're really trying to show that you know they're serious about this. But then there's a lot of equivocation. I don't think this is this case is true. This just happened at the end of October. And they haven't quite resolved it yet. And they're not, you know, they say we know where she is. She's practicing with the club in France somewhere. They're trying to find her, trying to get her back, trying to get her family to pull her back. Um, how this is going to play out, whether the men are going to be able to go, you know, to the next one or not, I don't know. Um, but it is, um, it's part of the drama of, of the day. And, and so, you know, maybe the women's game is becoming more like the men's football and Nigeria and other things, and I think it's it's an area I just want to say that needs more research. So somebody, okay, that's all. Yeah, I wonder if, if you could talk more about management as being part of it. I see a lot of economic, you know, notions, but I, I, you know, I'm thinking of a couple of examples. So one would be uh, the recent Tour de France winner, you know, who's Kent. And he, he, he's come out and talked about why he, he took up British citizenship. It was mainly because he could compete so in the Olympics. And he's, he's often he's gone on record saying that he basically entered himself into world competitions and they like hacked into the system just so because the Kenyan Federation has refused to, to give him the permission to go. And I don't think it was much about money because he could have still been a professional athlete uh, and kept his Kenyan citizenship and still been on a you know, professional European team. The other example I'm thinking of, again, is not necessarily about money, is Danny Gali, the, the Kenyan wrestler who defected to Canada in the 90s and won a gold medal for him uh, in the 2000 games, and is now back as the Federation head in Nigeria. And so here's, an interesting, here's a guy who defected, basically renounced his Nigerian citizenship and then came back. And he went on record saying that he basically you know, was told that he could go and compete in world championship and show up to the, the airport and there was no plane ticket for him and there was no so it didn't seem like necessarily it was you know going for a professional opportunity abroad. It was that he literally could not compete because the national teams or the federations were, were not just filing the paperwork uh, and doing that rather than necessarily so I, I don't know if it could be a little bit more discussion about that and why that is. It's the mismanagement is definitely there. You know, it's partly an economic issue. It's partly, you know, the, the political issues. Um, Michael Schatzberg did a, we, we had the, done this uh, thing on, on, on football in, um, uh, in Africa, and he wrote a great paper about what's going on in Ugandan federations and football, and there was just, you know, how it's intertwined with the political scene, and um, that, uh, yeah, it's definitely that, but it's, it's, you know, picking apart chicken and egg. Is it the economics first? Is it the politics first? Is it um, just straight old, you know, reality? Or, um, I think though, if you look at the longer, longer history of sport, including you know in the West, you have same similar issues of, of the management of sports in different places. And you know FIFA is considered corrupt even now, but they do it very slickly, and they're allowed to do it. You know, they, that's, it, is it good business or is it you know corrupt? But it could be both. <laughs> well, I, I think clearly that management does play a part. Uh, in Nigeria, for example, we have been a lot of uh, infection in terms of. Uh, particularly in track, track and field. Uh, a lot of people that just left the Nigerian Federation uh, decided to compete on the, say, the flag of uh, the ones in England, uh, maybe in Portugal. Uh, but the reason in that case was the issue of management, which is sort of related to um, uh, the power distance that I mentioned, where you have people who are highly dictatorial that are leading a federation and are not doing things for the athletes and are more, more concerned about their own ability to make money off the sport. And after a while, the athletes get frustrated that they are not going into competitions. For example, preparation for one of the Olympic Games, I cannot remember what I see, 2012 event. Uh, they, didn't com they had been competed in any international event. So these are the kinds of things also that it's some of these are misleading. Uh, but we, in, 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 in the case of football, most of it have been uh, you know, attached to the issue of economics and then uh, the issue
issue about also performance, you know, what is regarded as good performance, where do you have to play before you are recognized as being able to play for the national team. Because the national team is really highly prestigious to be able to play for the national team. That's the top of your of your athletic career. And you get to go to the World Cup. Exactly. And this time. I was going to say, you also, you also have this factor, this question of management, too, when you're talking about players who are declaring their FIFA nationality. It's not so much defection, or they're, they're defecting from one country to another, but plenty of players who know how the FIFA rules are, who can play for France wherever it goes, you know, Germany or Ghana. And these are these are because of FIFA's ridiculous rules, America, etc. And so these players, are, these players were often choosing their spots based on their potential to play, but also their management, mismanagement, their uh, without defection being a fact. This question is for Trina. You were saying that many um, players, in order to play for the national team, had to be played abroad. Mm -hmm. How many of them were actually able to be convinced to come back to play for the national team? And if they did come back, you were getting paid in euros, who were for American dollars. That's, that's for the value of it. Actually, if, if they are invited when they are overseas, they want, they would come back and play for the national team because that's their ultimate goal. Uh, the difference is just playing locally for the clubs. And the national teams in the past, Nigeria used to have a problem in terms of paying the bonuses. But this has been the case. The only problem recently was that the amount of money that players received in the national team used to be for, uh, for a game. If you win a game, you receive $10,000 each player. But recently, they reduced that to $5,000 because they claimed that the Federation no longer has money to be able to sustain the $10,000 per play. But the players still play because it's prestigious to play for the national team. And you're paid promptly if it's the national team, but not so with the clubs, the local clubs. There's a factor that is uh, very important in, in the mind of an athlete is to optimize his exposure. So it's not just about money, it's how hard can I play, how big. Athletes are driven by performance and egos. They want to perform the highest they can. And if a citizenship allows them to do that, and their own country is not making doing much, it is a clear, it's a simple choice to make. Playing for the national team, especially in football, it is critical because it gives them, especially if you can make it to the African Cup of Nations that is globally mediatized today, or you can make it to the World Cup, it gives you an exceptional exposure, and many of them, following a World Cup, we get a bigger contract. That is things that we sometimes forget in our analysis, the psychology and the mentality of elite athletes. It is even drugs, it's, it's driven essentially by winning, egos, prestige, and money will follow. Um, to add on to that, also there is the idea of competing against the best, right? That I think that here's something that's key. But um, I just want to ask maybe a general question to the entire panel. Um, um, I don't research on store, I do research on identity. And here, I was wondering, why do you think that athletes, sports, have such, you know, a, an important, um, I guess, a place in not only how Senegal or uh, Nigeria defines their identity, but how all of us do. So maybe here, why are these athletes and the movements of the athletes more important than, let's say, the movements of professors or doctors or things, like, or, or professors like that? And maybe just for everyone in terms of um, their opinions. I can the, this sport is is, uh, is different than other skill work. Uh, first, to be elite athlete compared to be a professor, you have to be an exceptional human being. Even the average, even the average elite athlete is a success. If you compare the rate of succeeding as elite athletes to get to the top, it's maybe 0.01% of all the kids who starts. 
if we look at the same statistics in many other disciplines, it's much higher. It's much higher. That's why uh, it is a market where, first, there is an uh, input, regular input of new talent that's going to push out the less competent or the less performant one. And they move around all the time because that's the way it is, is, a, is a rare uh, talent. Uh, there's a very specific case in basketball uh, big men, what they call in basketball big men, human being who are seven feet tall. It is just genetically rare. It's rare. And the NBA recruits. Their recruitment policy and uh, attempt it is they track down all these big men all over the world because statistically it is not common. And we see a lot of, I say, half of the big men in NBA are not American. They go after them anywhere. And this is a, the market of, uh, of pro sport and elite sports. No matter, the, even when they are average, they are still compared to the average human being, exceptional human machine. That's why they, they so, so and opportunities are everywhere today with rule, uh, uh, rules are, are more loose, especially the uh, FIBA rules, the uh, FIFA rules. And another critical factor of migration that we also overlooked, we talked about briefly generally, it is a Bosman ruling in Europe that opened suddenly a very close and controlled market to elite athletes they, across the globe. It opened the market, the open market to many, many, many athletes. What increased, uh, interestingly, also the migration of Senegalese men, athletes, because there's no restriction on the number of players from non-European origin that can play in the team as long as they have a work permit. Well, let me just add some. You mentioned Bosman, and the interesting thing about Bosman that while it was applied worldwide, in Nigeria, the internal transfer never caught up to, Bo to Bosman rule, and that led to a major issue this year, where the Bosman rule basically allowed you, if your contract was over with a club, you could move without that club receiving any compensation. But previously, before Bosman, you couldn't move, even though your contract expired. That club had to be compensated. But now the rule was allowed to allow athletes to move freely after their contract is over, which is the freedom of labor movement, the out of labor to move. But in Nigeria, they maintain the pre bossman rule where players were prevented from moving, even though they completed their contract. But this is an issue that is being widely discussed in Nigeria this year. Wonder if that's expanded now. <clears throat> so, uh, something else maybe that I want the panel to consider is um, so you gave a whole bunch of factors why this migration is kind of happening. Um, one thing, you, well, two things that you guys didn't touch on was nationalism and national identity. And I'm thinking specifically about the, the, the case of Egypt. Right? Egypt has been a powerhouse on the continent, say, for the last 30 years in football, whether it be in CAF or whether it be in terms of, of club football. What is kind of interesting about Egypt, though, is the fact that Egypt has managed to keep most of their best players in the country. Um, and so that's around a certain kind of nationalism. And, and also, I mean, and I, for me personally, I track it to the, the fact that Egypt doesn't have to deal with the same kind of inferiority complex that colonialism has kind of put on the rest of Africa. So, you know, there's a lot of kind of tropes around when a footballer from a specific country uh, does really well. There's a way in which, you know, there's a national pride in the sense that uh, we have to play is, is on the same level as everybody else, like the, 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 the players from Europe. You know, so there's a certain kind of um, way which feeds back into this kind of into the art conflict. So how do we, when we think about this migration, how do we think about kind of national national identity and then specific forms of nationalism? Well, I think one, one thing about Egypt, also the same thing with South Africa, is there's a players get paid if you're playing for the club. In a lot of these countries, like the Nigerian example, uh, nationalism is not going to put food on you on your plate. Basically, you you won't be able to make money in order for your family to live. So the, a key factor is if you're not being paid, 
you have a contract, you're not going to stay there. You're going to move to where you're going to be paid. The Nigerian players have moved to Egypt, and they don't have a complaint about payment. They are paid. They are paying their wages regularly. So that could also be an issue. But I, I think that even in these countries that we talk about, even in Nigeria and other places, there is that national identity that remains even with the players. Uh, they, they are not moving because they don't have any national identity. They are moving because of economic issues. They, that national identity is exhibited when they are invited for the national team, they will come. And some of them would even love to be invited to the national team. So that national identity remains. But you, you have to determine whether it's national identity that you would prefer over the money that you need in order to be able to feed your family. That's, that's an issue. And I think there's, there is also a bit of, I mean, it's, it definitely gets exploded quickly, but there is sort of a lag effect in colonial relationships. And so the fact that Egypt did not have the same colonial experience with other parts of Europe just means that there's not necessarily that same, where, you know, you'll have Algerian and Moroccan players going off to play all the time. And it, certainly Nigerian players don't always go to play for England, but there's that, there are those, those sort of um, natural colonial, you know, I don't say natural, but historical routes that go back and forth. And maybe with Egypt, one can speculate that that's, there's not as much of that, but then combined with the fact that they might be paid. But we have to remember that now there's alternative, you know, routes, at least in football, in Asia and in India, and, you know, so that now there's new things, you know, new in China, new things being routed and people playing in different places. But, um, but uh, something to add to that is I'm going to a more business context. Uh, except South Africa, uh, Egypt, eventually, to some extent, Tunisia, Morocco, Northern African countries, and one spot, I say clubs, across the continent with the capacity to sustain a professional team. Nobody else on the continent has that capacity. And when we look at the migration patterns, there's another under-research pattern. It is the intra-African migration. Tepe Mazembe in DRC. DRC is a country that's completely upside down. War, nothing is running fine in DRC, but there's one club in Congo where players make close to 100,000 euro a year. You have that at home, living standard, you stay home. You don't have to deal with competition, you don't have to deal with cold, you don't have to deal with many things. They stay home. And Egyptians, they make enough locally to have to run after uh, external contracts. And that's something that we also have to keep in mind. It is the asymmetrical uh, modification of sport management across Africa. African sport management is coming from the colonial era, still dominated by physical education as a formal form of training, completely dominated by that aspect, where the concept of having sport managed differently doesn't exist much, is left in the hand of who can afford a team or support a team. And the global mega industry of sport, which is very pulling, is pulling all the time the best. And, and from no matter our nationalism, identity, whatever we want, we are confronted to forces that we cannot resist. If we don't change the approach to sport, I'm not talking about having professional sport in Africa because it's not feasible, uh, economically it's not feasible, but at least a different way of managing sport, of rebuilding what sport means in our societies. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have to address if we want to look at migration from a different perspective. Okay, just one more question, oh, sorry. Um, I think it's important, I don't know that the situation in, in Egypt is necessarily right now, but it's Sub-Saharan Africa. I think when a player from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, makes it and goes to Europe, there, there's exaltation. I mean, he's made it. The, the nation's excited for him. He's in no way, shape, or form perceived as being unpatriotic or devoid of nationalism, or that he's somehow lost his national identity because he's going to play in Premier League, but he happens to be so no, perhaps that's the case in, in Egypt. I mean, there's not a long history of really successful Egyptian players in, in uh, so many of the European leagues. So, and, and you can, as has already been pointed out, you can 
the sporting infrastructure in Egypt is far superior to virtually every other nation in South Africa. So you, um, you can have a viable career. Who wants to leave home and you can be a, a, a celebrity and a hero in your own country? And so I don't think that that, I don't know that there are questions of nationalism or national identity when South Africa. I'll, I'll briefly to that with a quote of one of my informants. I was working on media and he told me before we people who represented Africa on the world stage were Brazilians. They were black, most of them. They were close to Africa in terms of economic status. And we they, we love them because we could affiliate to this place. But today, we turn on our TV, we see DJ Drogo. We don't need the Brazilian uh, middle players anymore. We, have, we are directly on the world stage. We are directly in the prestige, in the best of the game. And we, are, we love it, we enjoy it. That's what he was telling me. We, we can't test. We enjoy it because we play with the best. And the, what really raises the question of how do we express our identity and nationalism? It, it, it really raised that, uh, that question, and uh, I won't say friction, <coughs> or is it a complementary approach to nationalism and identity, but it's a, it's a question of pride. I was just going to quickly point out about nationalism, though. In certain cases, you know, the state has decided to make sport a showcase, and that you do it mainly with oil resources. So not all states, Nigeria hasn't really quite done it yet that way. But two cases, um, Sudan, when they had oil, North Sudan, now it's, it's gone away. But for a while, they were using their money to buy players from all over the place, mainly from African, you know, but they would buy players too. And their, their team did better. This is a football team. But the other state that did that was Ecuador and Guinea. And, and who are they importing? They're not importing other Africans. They're importing Brazilian women. And then they're winning the, the African Women Championship. Yeah, yeah. So they, yeah, the, the Equatorial Guineans use the oil money, and they're, you know, so they're bringing in people from elsewhere, mainly Brazil. So I think, it, it you know, the, the specificity, the, the certain circumstances do change those relationships. Maria. Um, yeah, Martha. On uh, the issue of Senegalese women basketball players staying closer to home and um, not having been as visible on the international scene. Um, if you look at the history of, of um, basketball in Senegal and you compare the, the women and the men's team, it is um, very apparent that women generally have a shorter career. Shorter? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering whether you think it's a, a, one of the main factors could be that um, they actually don't look at their career as a lifelong career, but as a temporary career. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know, there's this also societal pressure for them to get married mm -hmm. and have kids at mm -hmm. a certain age, and if that does not end their career, it certainly puts a stop, a stop to it for a while. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, and this, this is something I said. Like I kind of dabbled in this a bit, and not enough. But it, that's that sounds. But although some of them had babies, um, like I mean, drop, you know, who ended up dying. You know, she had kids and came back mm -hmm. and. Um, so some people were able to make it more of a career. And in 2011, when there was a lot of complaints around what was going on, part of the complaints were on the, the old players, the Alshon players, well, well they, they weren't leaving. They weren't letting the younger players coming up, which we've seen this in other sports, you know, where some people just hold on and they never, so, so some of them were actually quite older. But I don't, you know, I don't, what would be interesting to look over time on the national teams, how much turnover there was, and if at a certain point, I mean, maybe right around that moment, um, you know, in the, in the beginning of the 21st century, maybe, you know, it was the last golden moment. These people are holding on for dear life, and, you know, and what's going to happen with this next generation of basketball players? What opportunities? I, I kind of wonder that, that maybe it's partly the federation being torn apart, is that this, the golden moment of women's basketball might be over with now in Senegal. Um, they still, you know, have the most medals in, of, of African teams. But um, you know they, they haven't been performing well. Um, they you know they they kind of stay up there. And maybe they'll you know Mali is doing much better. Mali is the number one team I think uh, national African team right now for women. Uh, men? Uh, no, among, among, among women. I think they still I think they still hold it. Angola. Um, well, they, Angola did win, but I think the Mali team is still is still doing better internationally. So 
but I, I, this is something I would it'd be really interesting for someone to look at this and maybe you know compare in different different sports, different areas. What is the longevity in that? Um, you know, in, in Ethiopia, I know some runners were running for 20 years and being very successful and moving from you know the um, the 10,000 meters to the marathon. So you know, some sports you can do that, um, but. Maybe uh, you know it, it may it may have to do with the sport. It may have to do with the management and the training and your particular career. It may have to do with opportunities. Um, there's lots of variations. There. I wonder, is there a call? I mean, in the last panel, I was thinking about wrestling, and one of the things that uh, the, the challenge of, of doing this at the local level is, is that there's not this kind of culture of amateur sport. Mm -hmm. That that it, it is about the sort of professionalization. And, and, and you know the national team coach was lamenting that unless I offer something at this tournament, the youth won't turn out. They won't just do it because they think it's fun. Um, and I wonder if that is in part not creating that climate to you know have a vibrant professional league. I mean you know if you think of the you know in, in some ways because there isn't that grassroots kind of affinity from the local level and. I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, if how amateur sport plays in uh, to this kind of notion because the, the aspirations of that young person is, is only seen as a sort of way. Well, in, in the Francophone countries, um, they were all supposed to be amateur sports, but when they followed the French law on this, and so for the longest time, in, they were, you had to be amateur, and so you, you couldn't be paid, you know, e you know, at all. Even the, what looked like professional, they weren't paid. This, this is somewhat, you know, I don't know, maybe Suzanne knows, she's been closer in contact with some of, at least the Sendalese, she's been sitting behind you. And if they're, they're still technically all amateur, aren't they? Or, so, but it's a funny, it, but this is just the Francophone world. Um, but when I, I, I guess yeah, when I say yeah. amateur sport, I don't right. think of amateurs yeah. going to the Olympics. I mean, right. I think of, you know, very sort of like... Elite, elite versus yeah. the boss, you right. know, the, the base, no, this was always the complaint that you know, and, and some of the clubs actually, um, the associations, really did try to be, you know, multi sport, multiple sports, and really try to develop the base. And you had, like, the Catholic schools. Um, uh, some of them were very much about, you know, this youth education. So they did have a sense. And you had um, part of my presentation, which I didn't give, was about the referees that I met. These women referees who were working in schools, who were working with youth, and they also, you know, had careers as as referees for both men and women's, you know, more elite, but they were, you know, they were PE teachers as well. And so, you know, they were lamenting that the, the sort of the dearth, the, the, there was a golden age maybe back in this, you know, before 1994. But, uh, but uh, when, when physical education actually meant something. So the, but my analysis is uh, uh, when we, we track down how what we consider sports in most African countries today, modern sport, what we call modern sport, coming from Europe. It is a colonial uh, implant, and it's built from schools, a little bit from the army, in Congo churches, and after the post-colonial sport hasn't changed anything. And the most successful and the most uh, com uh, identity driven clubs are the clubs that came up from that area. And what is happening today, we have some new clubs with no history. They are built by somebody who is rich. And what they do, they have no connection. I look at the uh, 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 South African, the richest probably league on the continent. Stadiums are empty because people don't have strong affiliation with these things. They didn't grow up with them. Their parents didn't take them to the club, to the games. There's a lot of identification work that nobody paid attention to. We all think that we can have a club, we have the money, it's going to work. No. And most African sport today doesn't have that connection. It is all a, a, a surface that we are building on no roots, no nothing, and that's a struggle. That's one part of the difficulty to have a professional uh, sport. And the second one is pure economics. Professional sport is based on 
more and more on broadcasting money. Broadcasting is an interface for business to project their image. Uh, a business needs that because they are in competition. If you don't have a business in competition, the broadcasting is not interested because nobody is going to bring uh, uh, money to, for sponsorship or advertisement. And if you don't have broadcasting money, there's no pro sport today. And Africa is lacking of that industry, general industry in competition that needs the interface of media to bring money to sport. And without these two elements, I don't think we can uh, look at African sport viably to the same lens we look at pro and elite sport in the Western world. It has to be redefined probably from different angles. More comments? It's a round table. Can, can I just respond to some of the responses that came earlier on? Yes. You guys try to make it about money, right? And, and, I, and I accept that. But if you, if you think, for example, you use the example of Egypt and you use the example of South Africa, these are the two standard cases, great infrastructure, people get paid. Um, the thing though is that the, the way the, the, the nationalism, and by nationalism I don't necessarily mean selling out the country, right? I mean there can be nationalism and in the sense of the pride that you spoke about earlier on time. Um, so what I'm saying is that in South Africa, so in the South African case study, for example, there is a way in which there's a celebrity given to someone if they make it big to go and see. So it's not an issue of whether or not they can stay at home, is it viable financially, because it is, right? Um, it's, a, it's an issue of like what gets value, which is different. And I'm saying that this is something that we should get into the, into the discussion that there's a way in which the, a certain kind of nationalism, a certain kind of national identity will dictate whether or not a, a, a sports person will decide to stay at home or migrate. Okay? And so that kind of takes the whole financial issue off the table when we use those two, those two examples. And also takes us into the issue of, of how the nation is thinking of itself and what kind of nationalism is being fostered within that nation state. Not in naughty. <laughs> yes. It's rational. <laughs> Susan, any contribution? <laughs> or Michelle. The <laughs> Runners. That's an interesting case. The Kenyan Runners, they don't like it. Nope. Some of them do. They oh, go to Tara. Yeah, Tara. Yeah. Yeah. And that is when you think I, I have an opinion from that to be a bit more about the South, South and migration groups. You mentioned some of this in Africa, but, but it would be also interesting to see who's going to Brazil and who's going to Asia. And Asia is a big route. I need to work on that. and. Uh, it's, un it's unbelievable the number of people, African footballers, mostly Nigerians, Cameroonians, who go to Asia. And we see them, uh, the biggest group is probably in India, in the Calcutta region. Yeah, uh, there are as well. There are some Nigerian footballers. Indonesia? Yeah. Indonesia, yeah. Mm -hmm. Indonesia, and I look at, I talk to an agent in Indonesia, he's from Cameroon, who played the World Cup in 1990. Uh, his agent now, Roger Miller, played in Indonesia after the World Cup in 1994 in the US. Uh, that was the beginning of a Cameroonian route to Indonesia. <laughs> and uh, he said the Indonesian league is uh, much better than the Cameroonian league, what nobody should believe, considering the Cameroon uh, history with the World Cup, in terms of facilities and management. But it's subsidized by the government, mm -hmm. and the stadiums are full. Mm -hmm. What is, uh, it's difficult to, to believe, they fight all the time where the stadiums are full. And uh, we see African players in Laos, uh, Cambodia, uh, all the small Asian countries, then Bangladesh. Also, I want to also add that for women footballers in Nigeria, actually, they go to China for yeah. short-term contracts, which is kind of surprising. They go there 
and they have a contract for like maybe three months and they're back. Yeah. So short for short term contracts and they're doing the work. So we do that's also available. Then we have mm -hmm. one of the interesting things that we talked about, which I don't know that we have had in, you know people study that much, is the intracontinent uh, migration. No, we don't have uh, because there, there is a lot of that that also is taking place. Well, that's what the Senegalese basketball players who are in Cote d'Ivoire and Mozambique. I wanted to I put this up here because partly because I just want everybody to know who she is. Um, and you know, Samia Yusuf Omar. She she ran in, in Beijing Olympics for Somalia. She came in last, but it was a big deal that you know, she got there. So she was trying to get, play in London, and she migrated first to Addis Ababa and was trying to train there. And um, I never actually met her. I was there when I we, we were trying to talk. Like, we talked on the phone a bit, but she was trying to get the training and you know get sort of work off the success of the Ethiopian athletes. But I, for all sorts of reasons that I don't know and nobody really knows, it didn't work out in Addis. Um, she wasn't able to get the training she wanted there. And then she took off like many migrants and ended up drowning um, in 2012 in April before the, and, and nobody knew for several months. I mean, this, this was reported in August um, and you know, it was like she disappeared and maybe some people may have known, but they figured out finally that she drowned in one of these boats. And so part of this story is, is A, the intra-migration, being a Somali, you know, from a conflict, country in conflict, trying to make it, um, there's a couple of athletes that, that went there. You know, you'd think that maybe in Ethiopia, close by, she could have found that kind of training, but for all sorts of reasons, it wasn't gonna happen there. And I think that there was, to some extent, even though there's a lot of um, Somali Ethiopians and others, but there was just maybe some discrimination and she wasn't gonna get access. And there's money being exchanged and you can't do certain things, even in Ethiopia, there's a whole, there's a whole money thing in Ethiopia about, about how, how you end up running. But then, like many others, and we've heard these stories recently about all the people from Eritrea and, and um, Syria and Somalia who have been drowning off the coast of Italy, and she's one of them. So, um, and whether that's an athletic story or it's just a, a migrant story. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure I shared that. That's what I've been in a lot. Thanks for the presentation. I'm also thinking about the role of agents, uh, whether it's in soccer or any other sports, when they take uh, young African athletes to any destination, uh, Europe uh, or Asia. In the case of Zimbabwe, there's been so many issues with Polish agents who will change these young uh, athletes' age so that they, can, they are married in Europe. I've also read about Nigeria in some cases where uh, the edge has changed. But when they get to Europe, they are sold at a very uh, low price. After a year or two, they make, they make big money out of this uh, young African player. So I see that uh, there is the element of exploitation in terms of uh, migration also. I just have a quick comment. I think I found it all of your talk really interesting, but I also think it's interesting to see sometimes now you have um, people of African descent who are born in Europe who are now coming back and playing for their, the national teams of their parents. I mean, I might, my knowledge is mostly about Senegal, but you see these players who are born in France, raised in France, and maybe spent a few months in Senegal in their lives, and they're coming back and they're representing Senegal, and it's kind of this reverse of the diaspora. Yeah, into game now, like mm -hmm. getting them back. Right. Well, and then sometimes you have the situation where they're really just playing one federation against another one and trying to leverage their ability to play for multiple national teams and just this malleability of identity and national. The US team has it all clear. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's in, also, it's a new trend. At least I'm just looking for a way to get their best. Yes. Uh, yeah. but, it's a highly calculated decision. You exactly. have to determine where you're going to get the greatest exposure. It doesn't mean you're going to go to declare you're going to play for France if you're not even good enough to make the squad. You're going to sit on the bench. So if you play for something, all that gives you the exposure through the exactly. nation. So that's been interesting to watch that. It, it's not just an African story. No. The Mexican women's national football team, soccer team, is made up of many Californians. <laughs> you know, they're Californian second generation Mexican Americans. <laughs> But it's, it's a very interesting uh, matter in terms of identities. Mm -hmm. uh, how do they define their identity, uh, their parent identity themselves? 
or even how do the locals look at them? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's a very fascinating. Uh, and there's one Algerian who was born in, if he's French, born Algerian descent. He tried a football career in France, couldn't make it. And out of the blue, he got a phone call and got a, a contract in Algeria. And he said, I'm in Algeria, but really, I don't, I'm not Algerian. But he's in Algeria playing professional football, living his dream of being a professional footballer in Algeria. He doesn't fully identify himself to Algeria. He wants in Algeria, he's more French. It's, uh, it's a very uh, and uh, very complicated identity matter. Uh, I think I talked about it two years ago in the ASA, when the French were trying to impose quota on uh, what's very interesting, quota on black players. And he leaked. A big, a big deal. But most of these players are born French, they grew up in France. If you don't see them, you listen to them. There's no, in themselves, you don't see them different. But the identity, it's, uh, I see we all have multiple layer identity, but in football, it's becoming almost a norm. Yeah, yeah. the case of the Boateng brothers, so I'm yeah. Yeah. Actually, in terms of the Puerto brothers, the Puerto brothers, the one that's playing for Ghana, there's been a lot of backlash yeah. where people saw him as taking advantage. That because after the last World Cup, he'd been invited several times and he didn't show up. Then suddenly, this World Cup is coming up and he's back. Right. So there's a lot of backlash that follows <coughs> Nigeria has a case now where Shola Amoebi, who during the height of his professional career, Nigeria was asking him to play for the national team and he refused. He wanted to play for England. But right now at the end, the tail end of his career, he gave him an invitation and he arrived and he's hoping to play for Nigeria in the World Cup. So there's a lot of backlash where people are saying, no, he, he doesn't deserve to play on the national team. Why did he reject Nigeria before and he's coming now trying to take advantage to play in the World Cup? So you get that kind of backlash also that exists. I was just wondering when these um, athletes retire, you know, after they've been circulating, what is anybody looking at what happens to them then or their identities, you know, in that sense? Do they have income to live on or are they doing other things? Or what happens? I think we all have anecdotes. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, some people, um, Manu Bol, for instance, he came, you know, from Sudan, played in the United States, and, you know, the end of his life was kind of tragic. Um, and there's a lot of stories like that of you know people going back and, and trying or you know getting involved in politics or the economics of the situation or just you know the same as in the United States with athletes who you know end up with you know too many concussions and get ill or they spend everything or no one ever taught them how to you know, invest for the future. So that's I don't know. I mean, it'd be interesting to to try to figure out if this is you know how many have been able to leverage as in the Kenyan case you know to leverage. And, and certainly in Ethiopia, you see a lot of the runners also, you know, becoming very wealthy. But you know, as is that the exception, um, or how many? You know? As a historian, I mean, this is part of the work that I'm doing. Is that these players were highly cognizant of what was going to happen after they retired because there wasn't the big money wasn't there yet, and so they're sort of parlaying their, their ability to to relocate to migrate and thinking very, very seriously and very early about what they were going to do when they're they're either three, 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 four, and so they're. They were one of the things that these players were doing were enrolling in universities while they were playing. In fact, some of their teams were affiliated with universities, and they only fielded matriculated students. And so this was sort of a very strategic decision. Others are playing for clubs that, um, uh, for uh, companies, essentially, that only fielded employees. And so that was a way that they could get a job short term, and then also they were guaranteed employment long term. So I think the further you go back in history, the more sort of cognizance you will encounter uh, because this is pre big money. I mean, now, nowadays it's so different. Sign one contract and you're be set for life. And so, and unfortunately, we see how tragic this often is. These guys really don't do any planning, they have a lot of money, they don't really want to do it. But that's why really interesting to sort of track these two, maybe since the 90s or something. Mm -hmm. But also, comparatively, are they doing any worse than athletes elsewhere? Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think that 
and they look really maybe they're doing better because they go back home. Right. Generally, like the runners in Bill, they invest in free uh, states. That's uh, generally what they do. Uh, they don't, they can't live the lavish life anymore, but most of them go back home. They go back to their, to their home country, their home city. Met a few, but in general, it's just extremely hard to transfer from a professional athletic life to a regular life. It's just extremely difficult. And, uh, depression. It, it is is a very hard moment to believe that you were in the middle of a, another life sport for so long, and suddenly it doesn't take long; it take a year or two. You become close to anonymous. How do you live that as a human being where your ego had defined you, your success had defined you for so long? And if you, the saddest part for all this, uh, we talk, uh, we wrote about the academies. You enter an academy, football academy at 13, 12 years old. And most likely, you won't get much education. You get a pro contract. By the time you are 32, the only thing you have done your whole life is to kick a ball. And suddenly, face the reality. What am I going to do with myself? Well, I don't know anything. I can't do anything. It's, uh, we don't know. It'd be interesting to look at it, especially the generation, the uh, generation. That's a generation that really entered the academies. Uh, I think these guys try coaching with their lives. Yeah. That's a logical progression. Yeah. 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 Not a good question. Yeah. There, there actually, I, I, and I'm now recalling a study I saw of Olympic athletes, so not specific to Africa, but just Olympic athletes in general, and the lot are very depressed post-Olympics. You know, the career, I mean, it's not, not a good story, obviously. Any more comments? Contribution? Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jatara, for the